Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India On today's lecture number 29th, we uh, actually uh, adopt a totally a different method. So far, we have been uh, talking about uh, solution methods based on mathematical classification. Uh, from this lecture onwards, we are going to simply highlight the scientific and high performance computing aspect uh, alone. And in the process, we uh, basically try to develop uh, high accuracy methods. Um, which will by itself be non-dissipative, non-dispersive and which will have very high spectral accuracy. <clears throat> and one of the candidate method is uh, basically a Hermitian implicit method, which is also known as the Pade approximation uh, that gives rise to what is uh, called as the general compact scheme. So, we are going to talk about uh, compact schemes now onwards and in the process, uh, what we do in this compact scheme is we try to set up auxiliary relations in addition to uh, the differential equations and we try to obtain the derivatives simultaneously at uh, many points together uh, and we begin this discussion by uh, talking about the derivation methods for first derivatives, adopting methods with uh, uh, stencils which are essentially uh, symmetric or central. And by using uh, Taylor series analysis, we can uh, uh, set up uh, uh, methods which are called high order compact uh, schemes. Uh, this uh, essential idea is to set up uh, implicit relations between the functions and the derivatives and equating uh, the terms uh, order by order, we can uh, really get uh, uh, very, very high order compact schemes. <clears throat> we uh, perform a global analysis uh, in the wave number plane for uh, this compact scheme and uh, we noticed that uh, many of the uh, older compact schemes had some problem with the boundary stencil. Uh, we explain it uh, physically that these uh, problems arise due to stability, instability or over stability at either end of the domain. And uh, we uh, notice that uh, uh, when we have a periodic problem, this does not uh, cause any problem. It is essentially a problem with the non-periodic problem. And as an example, we uh, talk about a sixth order scheme that is uh, due to Lele. And we talk about uh, in general the basis for choosing this compact schemes because we said that these are auxiliary relations. So, there must be some basis. This uh, relates to what we call as a consistency condition and there was another way of uh, method that was investigated by Haras and Tassan. They tried to minimize the error as a optimization problem uh, and they looked at the problem in the wave number space and tried to develop a compact scheme. Let us uh, get to the uh, real core of the subject, you know. Uh, when we talked about scientific computing, our intention was to develop methods uh, which will uh, give you uh, accurate solutions. You know, people do talk about high performance computing, and if you have noticed, uh, my first lecture was a sort of a ridicule on that claim. What is high performance computing? Uh, we talked about that what people used to do in 80s and used to claim as supercomputing or high performance computing as it is called, uh, we have more computing power today. Uh, that does not mean those people who were doing uh, leading edge research those days are doing the same today. There is a mismatch uh, all, all along. So, instead of talking about uh, high performance computing, uh, we should uh, focus our attention on accuracy because that is something you can define, right? which is not a fashion statement. Say tomorrow Intel will announce a new chip set and then we will be 
calling whatever we did yesterday was not high performance computing. It is not that. So, we, we, we try to uh, define everything with the, uh, uh, I would say SRBK uh, to talk about what is uh, it that we re require is basically high accuracy. And that is what you notice that the first uh, point uh, mentioned here is that if you want accuracy of course, you will have to resolve all uh, relevant uh, spatial and temporal scales and that is what we uh, decide to do. And when we do that, we also like to develop numerical methods uh, which does not superpose additional layers of uh, sources of error. So, for example, uh, we by now know uh, with our analysis that um, numerical scheme must be neutrally stable, we cannot afford to have uh, overtly dissipative uh, solutions which may look good, make us feel uh, comfortable, but the solutions are nonetheless erroneous. So, that is not the way we would like to go. We would like completely non-dissipative uh, schemes, so that we follow the physics of the problem the differential governing equation themselves will dictate uh, the accuracy. You do not have to do numerically something, although uh, you may have noticed in yesterday question paper, last question that I asked was solving the convection equation by a first order upwind scheme and a uniformly second order scheme and I asked which is better. The answer is the first order, because there you could choose a parameter, the CFL number n is equal to 1 and then you would get the most accurate solution. That is something happens once in a while for a model equation for model parameters. A priori we do not know the solution, so we do not know how to select those parameters. So, we should not really aim at uh, uh, this uh, 2 that we are seeing, it is not working today. Anyway, <coughs> the third uh, part is a very, very uh, um, contemporary uh, part of our discussion. It is a global phenomena that um, people do uh, advertently or advertently uh, compute and get solutions which are plausible, but they are inherently wrong. And uh, this is true of uh, especially in uh, fluid mechanics, when you are looking at uh, high Reynolds number, high uh, Rayleigh number, Keckler number flows, where you see that uh, you have to uh, resolve all those wave numbers and at high wave numbers as we have seen, uh, we can uh, invoke uh, dispersion error and we uh, often have this uh, tendency in the absence of standard solution to view this uh, spurious solutions as to be representing turbulence and that is a, one of the disease of the modern day and we should uh, resist from doing that. So, the third point is nonetheless uh, still very uh, important. We need to talk about uh, no spurious dispersion. <coughs> and um, some uh, somewhere, someone have said uh, that um, you know you need a high accuracy uh, solution. Uh, so, basically what you need to do is uh, reduce your discretization error and one of the major source of discretization error is truncation. And so, people try to derive higher order schemes. Higher order schemes by now we know uh, have the lesser. So, we always try to develop higher order schemes. Uh, but as we propose to do in this module of the course, to show that uh, higher order is not synonymous to this always, uh, what should be attempted is uh, to basically classify method based on their behavior uh, in the k space, because that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to resolve k different wave numbers. So, we will look at in k space and find out how these schemes are doing and there we would notice as we intend uh, proving that classification based on order of truncation error is uh, truly inadequate. We need to do better. Uh, why uh, and how we do it? That is the name of the game in this path. We are going to talk about some extremely high accurate schemes. Uh, these are called the compact schemes. They are uh, uh, based on uh, what is called as part A approximation.
And uh, one of the attribute of this uh, method is uh, that you almost get uh, near spectral accuracy uh, while keeping the scheme as compact as possible, right. So, that is what we will try to do. Uh, essentially, uh, this compact schemes are uh, implicit in the sense that they relate the derivative uh, with the function in an implicit manner as uh, shown here in equation 1. For example, let us say we are trying to derive this uh, nth derivative, uh, which is uh, shown here on the left hand side with the uh, superscript uh, within the uh, bracket to indicate the order of the derivative. So, this is the nth derivative. Uh, they are written in a implicit manner. So, they are not uh, explicitly evaluated point wise. They are all uh, indicated by the node index here j plus k. k goes from minus n l to n r and j is the point where we are actually maybe focusing our attention upon. Okay. So, uh, what you notice that for nth derivative on the right hand side, we prefer to write it in this way that uh, h to the power n uh, would be invoked in that fashion. So, that this b k, this uh, multiplicative coefficient on the right hand side with the function uh, are pure numbers, they do not depend on grid spacing. Okay. Whatever grid uh, dependence comes, that comes through this side. You have already noted that, right. First derivative we always divide by h, second derivative we divide by h square. So, so on and so forth. So, this is a general pattern we would like to do. And to uh, comfort you, uh, to tell you that what we are uh, doing here is not just simply a pedagogic exercise, which has uh, rather relevant practical application. Let me tell you that although we are writing this uh, generic equation for a grid with uniform spacing h, but you can actually directly use it for non in non-uniform grid. But of course, you will have to do is uh, you will have to transform your governing equation first. You will have to do additional step there. Whatever the governing differential equation you have in the physical plane or the Cartesian frame, that is what we most of the time write. We transform it into a uh, uh, sort of a computational plane, and in the computational plane, we always have uniform spacing. So, once we decide to do that, you realize that the scope of uh, such an exercise uh, expand enormously you can perhaps do almost all possible problems that you have. In fact, I have told you that uh, this method I am teaching you, because even today the flow field around space shuttle is calculated by this method, not by finite element or finite volume method. This has extreme uh, uh, applications and it has uh, delivered its promise very satisfactorily so far. <coughs> so, uh, let us uh, look at uh, the bandwidth of the such a scheme bandwidth is determined by how many points across which the derivatives are related shown by this uh, n l and n r on the left hand side. Same way we also notice that the bandwidth of the scheme also is determined by the function values. So, uh, what we are trying to do, I suppose uh, let me give you a flavor of uh, the thing that we are uh, trying to do is uh, let us say we are uh, trying to solve a problem, space time dependent problem we always uh, get. <clears throat> this is a very, very generic uh, problem that we uh, come across, a vector equation I am writing for say fluid mechanics. This is what we do. This is what is called the Navier-Stokes equation, right. So, some of you, most of you are familiar with. But what you notice is that uh, we are talking here of spatial discretization, right. So, we are essentially talking about evaluating terms of this kind, right. In the compact scheme, what you do earlier, what we had done, if we had a term like this, we would have uh, uh, written it like this of uh, say u x del del x plus u uh, y uh, del del y. Let us say in a 2D problem, this is how we would be doing, and here we would be writing the vector. So, if I do it for u x component, I will write u x. If I do it for y component, I will write u y. Now, earlier what we did in explicit method, we specifically wrote those derivatives here, del u x. But here, in, uh, instead of uh, going through that route, we propose to use this kind of a 
functional relationship in evaluating the derivative. So, I could set up a method by which I could probably say calculate uh, this kind of derivatives a priori by uh, using this uh, equation given here. So, I, I could do that. Okay. Or the same way, I could also use the similar sort of scheme by putting this n equal to 2, then I will be getting this kind of terms, right. So, there you can uh, do all this. So, basically the compact scheme means uh, we are trying to evaluate this uh, derivatives that we have written here using this equation. And we will do it because it uh, delivers more accuracy, but you can realize that apart from solving the differential equation, you are imposing some additional task on yourself, uh, writing such auxiliary equations. These are not part of the problem, right? This you are doing it to evaluate those derivatives more accurately. And once you do those derivatives more accurately, uh, then you will see uh, the amount of benefit that you derive. So, basically then uh, what we need to do is for each of these derivatives that we are writing here, we would write out similar equations. And once we do that, uh, we are uh, going to use those. So, once we have evaluated from those auxiliary equations, these uh, derivatives will then go into this equation and plug them there and that is the whole strategy. So, now you understand how and uh, what way we are going to do. So, that is why you know the bandwidth is important. We need to find out how many points are involved in evaluating uh, these derivatives via this auxiliary equations that we have written. Now, uh, we uh, by now we are uh, familiar that uh, on the, if I would have written a corresponding explicit scheme, I would have probably just simply written like this. right? I am looking at the jth node, I am trying to evaluate the nth derivative, I would have uh, probably just uh, simply written a corresponding equation like this. right? Uh, we have written there. Right? And uh, we generally go from uh, the bandwidth uh, defines how uh, far we will have to go. Uh, we also notice that uh, if this tensor on the right hand side uh, has this kind of a property, what we are talking about here in terms of a k, but suppose if I write here if the b k's are symmetric, if this quantity is symmetric, then what do we get? We will get a uh, symmetric stencil, right? And thus that symmetric stencil would not involve the next order term. So, what, what I am trying to say will be become, will become very appropriate if I let us say uh, represented by the derivative of the first derivative, if I do, then you can see the example clearly. What we uh, do here, if we recall that we have do it like this, right. So, this is like your uh, second order scheme and if I am not wrong, you can uh, you can actually convince yourself what I am writing is correct or not by doing the Taylor series approximation and check that this is a second order scheme, this is a fourth order scheme that we know. What I am saying essentially is about the jth node, the coefficients are uh, symmetric modulus. Uh, the sign are opposite. What does it do? Of course, it uh, removes all all odd or even. We have, we will remove all the even derivatives, right. So, that is one of the thing. If we retain those even derivatives, they would have given rise to numerical dissipation, right. So, we do not want to do it. So, as you see that um, what I am um, 
what we already know from explicit scheme uh, are transferable to what we do with this uh, implicit scheme also. So, on the left hand side we would require this coefficient a of k should be uh, symmetric about a naught and furthermore, if we have the bandwidth same, if, if suppose if I had additional term here that would have remained unbalanced that would have given us uh, all kinds of derivatives and that would uh, not give us a uh, central scheme. So, same way in the compact scheme also the centrality of the scheme is determined by this condition that a k's have to be symmetric about a naught and the number of points have to be same on uh, either side of the node under consideration. <coughs> now, uh, what requires to be done is to fix uh, this coefficient a k and b k. Uh, how did we go about doing this? Of course, uh, what we did was we wrote the Taylor series and equated the coefficient and fixed the coefficient. For example, here you can find out what is b 1, b 1 is uh, 1 by 2 half right, right b plus 1 and b minus 1 are same in magnitude 1 is 1 by 2 other is minus half and here you can see 1 by 12 uh, and then 2 thirds, 2 thirds and again 1 by 2 right. So, this is the way that uh, we have done for explicit scheme we can uh, do the same thing here for the compact schemes too. So, uh, better to go uh, and take a look at a specific example uh, talk of deriving first derivative uh, in terms of functions and uh, what we do perhaps uh, take a case where let us say the first derivative is uh, uh, estimated by taking a bandwidth of 2. So, it is basically if we are looking at u j prime we take 2 points to the left 2 points to the right on the left hand side and when we uh, try to relate the functions, uh, the functions are what we have written down here uh, involves um, 7 points right plus 3 to minus 3 including u j that will be 7 points. So, this is uh, one of many possible ways that one can approach this problem. So, view this as a kind of a generic equation. So, what happens is what happens is uh, in addition to the actual solution of the differential equation, first we will have to do this homework. Given the function right hand side, we are trying to find out what those first derivatives are. That is the auxiliary step that we will have to go through in this exercise. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, as I said that we have to relate those coefficients uh, by Taylor series expansion and uh, what we are going to do is as we write uh, this Taylor series expansion we will have uh, uh, expressions of uh, various orders on either side and we try to match those coefficients uh, and then uh, the first unmatched coefficient that remains that determines the order of accuracy of the representation. So, for example, uh, flip back to the previous page and uh, if I look at uh, the coefficients of let us say u j prime, it will be 1 from here, from this and this I will get 2 alpha, from this and that I will get another 2 beta. So, the coefficients of u j prime on the left hand side is 1 plus 2 alpha plus 2 beta. Same way we could expand this uh, individual uh, groups and uh, find out that we would find this is the coefficient of u j prime on the left hand side, this is the coefficient of u j prime on the right hand side. No? So, if I satisfy this equation that means what we have been very exact up to the first derivative. What is uh, not satisfied is the next uh, order term. So, that is why we will call such an equation where we uh, try to evolve those, uh, evaluate those coefficients by satisfying equation 3 would lead to a second order method. Because what happens, what will be the next uh, term? Next term would be the third derivative, right. So, the third derivatives when I match, then again I will get the next higher order scheme that is the fourth order scheme. And the coefficients you can actually find out the third derivative on the left hand side 
invokes of 6 times alpha plus 4 beta and on the uh, right hand side you get this. You can very clearly see the pattern, this is 2 square, this is 2 cube and so on and so forth. You can relate that very easily by that uh, specific way of composing that equation too. Now, you can uh, go through this exercise and then you can see that um, if you match the coefficients up to fifth derivative by invoking the previous two equations plus this, then you end up with a sixth order scheme. If you additionally match the seventh derivative terms, then you will get up to their eighth order scheme and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the question is um, how many unknowns do we have? We have five unknowns, right? A, B, C, alpha and beta. That is what we are trying to find out. So, at the most what we could do is uh, we could satisfy all of this equation, right? All these five equations that we have written so far, five equations, five unknowns and then we are done. So, we can in a sense have a unique uh, tenth order scheme out of this. Okay? However, if you try to let us say uh, decide to go for a sixth order scheme, then what you would be solving? You will be solving these three equations, right? That is for the second, the first derivative, the third derivative and the fifth derivative. So, this up to fifth derivative. So, we have three equations, right? So, uh, we have to be then uh, solving for those three equations. What are the additional things that we have to do? We will come to that later, but let us uh, try to see what we uh, do operationally. Let us not just simply talk about uh, what we do uh, in, a, in an analysis mode, but what we actually do in computing. In computing, uh, what we are doing here, as you can see on the left hand side, you have uh, the unknown derivatives, which I can write as a vector and that should be multiplied by a matrix which we are calling as A and as you have seen, uh, they happen to turn out to be, well we will see that uh, constant coefficient uh, entries of uh, this matrix A for the derivatives and B the coefficients of the function. So, that is what you will have to do. So, you have the computational domain, you would be setting up an equation of this kind and you will be evaluating those each of those derivatives. I am purposely uh, avoid, avoiding to write which derivative it is. Let us say if you are solving a 2 D problem, you would have a flow problem, you will have probably two components of velocities and each one will have two derivatives. So, you will have to solve such four equations, four sets of equations for calculating del u x del x, del u x del y, del u y del x and del u y del y. So, we will have to be uh, executing this step for uh, four such derivatives. Now, this is something uh, I suppose um, some of you may have uh, difficulty uh, in the beginning to appreciate what we mean by a periodic problem and a non-periodic problem. I think this uh, despite our uh, various exposure before, let us say we take a domain of this kind and then we have uh, discretized by uniformly spaced point and uh, the point goes like this. A periodic problem is actually doing it repeatedly on the outside. So, this is something again uh, not uh, written explicitly in the book, but whenever you do any computing, you choose a domain and uh, you are trying to extract knowledge within this domain how does that knowledge relate to what is happening outside? This, this is a question that has been uh, sort of bypassed and uh, people probably do not appreciate. Whatever may be the original nature of the problem, whenever we decide a domain and we do this, we have actually an extension of the same problem for the rest of the universe at the period of that. So, that is why what happens is even though so, your original problem is non-periodic and if you solve a problem in a limited domain or if you increase it, increase the domain size, you happen to see a quite a bit of a difference in the solution. So, what is a periodic problem? Periodic problem means if I have uh, let us say the solution at u x 
at x equal to 0 is u at x equal to 1. This is a physical condition of periodicity of the problem. So, physical variables are periodic. What I just now said that in computation, we always have a periodic extension of the computational domain. That is a different aspect. That is what your numerics does. Whether you like it or not, your numerics always do that. This is something you must keep the back of your mind. Uh, however, uh, if this condition is not satisfied, if this is true, then this is your periodic problem. So, this is what we are talking about physical periodicity. And if q at x equal to 0 is not equal to u at x equal to 1, then this is what we call as non periodic problem. Right? So, that is what we are uh, stating here also that if we have a periodic problem that I have explained to you many a times before, this A matrix and the B matrix will be periodic. Okay? Um, we have also seen, if I go back to uh, this generating equation 2, um, if I decide to obtain the derivatives for such a system, you can very clearly see that uh, j can start only from, where can it start from? No, j equal to 4, right, that, that is good, because you can see if I, if I try to apply this at j equal to 3, I do not have the information. I am filling out of the domain, right. So, you can see uh, where this uh, choice of the scheme originate is our ability to uh, handle such equation in a most generic fashion. So, uh, there is this problem of compact scheme, although it promises to give you high accuracy, uh, but you have to see that uh, to set up a equation like this, um, you will have to apply such generic equation only in the interior nodes. And that interior node starts from j equal to 4 here and ends at, suppose I have n points, it should be n minus 4, right. So, that is the whole idea. So, what happens many a times to avoid such difficulties, you purposely set the c equal to 0. Then you can start the uh, this thing uh, stencil that we have written here from j equal to 3 to n minus 3. So, you can uh, realize that uh, uh, there are so many variations possible, but uh, it also tells you that if we adopt uh, such a scheme, we will have to do something special for the leftover points. Suppose I decide to take 2, then I will have to write a uh, similar equation for j equal to 1, j equal to 2, j equal to 3. From j equal to 4 onwards, we will be using this. The same way, uh, we will have to write out equation for j equal to n, j equal to n minus 1 and j equal to n minus 2, because this equation will be varied from 4 to n minus 3. Right? So, you got to realize that uh, the compact schemes uh, have this uh, problem that if you have a non-periodic problem, then you will have to have additional near boundary stencil. That is what I was explaining to you, that you have to write additional uh, such equations. And those equations are what? You know, because as we are saying that we are restricting our computation in a domain, we have knowledge on only about what is happening inside. We do not know what, is, what are of the states of the variable outside. So, the near boundary stencil, if I want to write it for j equal to 1 or 2 and 3 and so on and so forth, um, I have to write those derivatives only in terms of what we know. We cannot get information from outside. Then what happens? See, any derivative that I am evaluating here, the information only comes from interior of the domain on this side. What about here? this information also comes from inside. What happens then? When we write down this near boundary stencil, then we are actually imposing some 
numerical conditionality of the information propagation. On the left hand side, it goes from right to left and on the right side, it goes from left to right. Suppose, I am solving a simple equation like this. You know, that is why we will be looking at this equation very often. This is such a nice equation. This actually set the gold standard for all computing. If you can do something with this equation, just go home. Do not waste your time. If you cannot solve this equation correctly, do not hope by any other fancy method, it, life will be easier. What is interesting about this is, if c is positive, then what is happening? The information is propagating from left to right. Now, if I uh, use this, what we are suggesting that we need to have a interior uh, near boundary stencil and this is actually the information is propagating this way and the numerical condition imposed violates physics and uh, you would uh, be assured, you will be happy to note that when you violate physics, your numerical method actually blows up locally. Locally, you will see that you are trying to oppose the propagation of the signal in the correct direction, that will immediately hurt you in terms of numerical instability there locally. But having said that, this is something you must realize that um, in many uh, such uh, exercise, why it does not uh, create catastrophe? Let us say we are trying to solve this equation uh, in a domain like this and we are setting up some near boundary stencils like this for say this uh, three additional nodes on the left, three on the side. Then what will happen? Here we are sending the signal from this way and here we are sending it from there. So, this what we are getting here is uh, non-physical nature of this discretization. Whereas, this aids in the actual physical propagation of the signal, right? We can see that this aids, but we also know from our exam paper yesterday, you have seen that first order upwinding, if you do not choose the N C correctly, you actually overdo it, you can overdo it. So, what happens there? This leads to numerical instability. And uh, this is physical, I will put it in parenthesis, I mean quotes that physical discretization, it does not violate the directionality, but if you are not careful, then you may end up with lot of numerical dissipation. At the most, you can hope to do it without any dissipation, additional numerical dissipation, but at least it would not do. Now, you may ask me a question, then how come uh, people still do it and get away with it? Well, uh, the answer is uh, right in front of you, because what happens is, apart from the signal itself, the error would also be governed by a equation like this, but with some right hand side that we have established very clearly. Now, what happens is that means the error also has a directionality that shows that it should go in, in the same direction as the signal. What happens is as the error is going to grow here, but it is also convecting. So, after few time step, the error which was here, it will be inside beyond this third point. And once they are inside, they are not violating the physical issues, right? Physical direction. So, what happens is this is a actually a tragedy of computing because what happens is people do this, then 
then they go back and say, look, I am doing direct numerical simulation. Because what has happened? You are artificially creating a source of error because of numerical discretization. And that error actually goes inside your computing domain. Once they are outside this bad nodes, they are no more violating the physical directionality. Because there your uh, scheme is ok. I mean you are doing perfectly central scheme. That is why we are looking at central scheme. We do not want to impose additional dissipation. So, from j equal to 4 onwards, you are in a safe territory. So, what happens is in a problem like this, if I am solving, then I am always in a spurious sense, I am exciting the system from the left hand side. And the same way, when I am coming on this last three nodes, if I am not careful, I am adding numerical dissipation. So, those errors decaying also. So, what happens is without your knowledge or intent, you are exciting the system spuriously on the left and damping on the right. So, what happens is if you are solving a problem, you would not require any disturbance and you would still see as if the flow has been excited. This has that is what I said, this is a tragedy because people do not have the proper quantification of what is this additional excitation that we are creating. See the numerical excitation and the physical excitation in a real physical problem, not necessarily going to be the same, right. If I if I take a different numerical method, I will excite the problem in a different fashion and in the physical world, the background disturbances are probably sometimes not known. You know my favorite example of tossing a coin, we do not know what are the sources of error there. That is why we will never be probably able to write out a governing equation, evolution equation. If I give you an initial condition, a coin is facing head upwards at this time, at this height, you toss it with this much of force, tell me what will be the outcome when it comes back on the ground. That is the simple problem of tossing a coin, right. Newtonian mechanics, but we still have not uh, seen the end of the problem, right. We do not know what are these background sources, whether we are modeling all possible disturbances or not, we will never be able to know. Now, suppose of course, you give it to some people uh, involved in mathematical and numerical modeling, they will always come out with some results and the paper will be announced in nature saying that if you face eastward with your left hand tucked in your pocket, the coin will come face head up, right. So, there would be lots of such exciting papers and commentaries of experts, how things are changing. We have now super computing ability. Uh, so, that is the story, but the point remains that if we are solving a problem, any problem, we cannot characterize the background distance and we do not know, we have not uh, been able to even today definitively establish the causality. causality. I just read two days ago, this uh, new theory has been proposed for this large collider. Apparently, the people behind this, they are afraid that it will not work. So, they have said, if it does not work, it will prove God exists. It is for rest of you to figure out what it is. You, you understand what they are talking about? I do not. Uh, well, they say that uh, some particles called Higgs boson will be created and the gods do not like it. So, God will not allow this uh, collider to function, ok. So, that is the end of the story. You prove two things, Higgs boson exists, God exists by non-functional collider in Geneva. That is a wonderful research that we do these days. <coughs> Anyway, uh, we are coming back to this. So, what has happened here that we create some kind of a numerical disturbance on the left hand side and we expect that that is going to mimic the physical universe. That is bit of a uh, sort of a optimism I suppose. People are optimistic, so we cannot fault them for that, but let me assure you that uh, we do not know the exact relationship between physical disturbance environment with numerical. To expect that all numerical simulation 
will eventually lead to the same physical results has yet to be proven. Right? So, this is something you must realize that many of the papers that you would be looking at in various journals, they will be saying that we are doing direct simulation, means we, we do not have to uh, characterize the background disturbance and we will still get the results. Well, I suppose uh, that is yet to be proven and if somebody does it, uh, that should really deserve uh, sort of credit for that kind of proof. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the aside of uh, that equation 2 that we have written here, that if we uh, somehow decide a priori that uh, we set beta equal to 0, then on the left hand side we have uh, a tridiagonal matrix structure, A is a tridiagonal matrix and then we already know how to handle that, uh, because we have the Thomas algorithm here and uh, that should allow us to solve this. And uh, well, please sir, there is a mistake here. Uh, so, what happens is um, that uh, in solving this auxiliary equation, you will have to be using Thomas algorithm and we know if the size of the matrix is n, then we will be ending up doing 5 n to 7 n calculations depending on whether you have a periodic problem or a non-periodic problem. Okay. So, let us uh, do a concrete example. So, it is better that way that we set uh, to begin with beta and c equal to 0. So, that left hand side we have uh, uh, a tridiagonal structure, but on the left uh, right hand side we have a pentadiagonal structure, right. It is going from j minus 2 to j plus 2. And, uh, <coughs> What you do is uh, write down the Taylor series, equate the coefficients of u prime, u triple prime and u fifth prime and then you get these three equations for this uh, three unknowns. Okay? You solve it, you get this unique value. So, this is a unique uh, description of the problem. However, you realize that this scheme, uh, we can only use it from j equal to 3 to n minus 3. Uh, for 1 and 2 with this equation will not work, so is for n and n minus. Okay. <clears throat> what you are noticing here, I uh, would like to draw your attention to this, what I call here as a consistency condition. We are in the business of evaluating the first derivative. So, come what may, we will have to satisfy this equation for sure, because that is our basic business to evaluate the first derivative correctly. So, satisfaction of this equation is a must and that is why we call this as a consistency condition. right? So, please do realize that if you are evaluating the first derivative, the coefficients of u prime gives you the consistency condition, which you cannot give up. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, this is a clear example of how uh, these derivatives can be worked out. You also realize that if you have a periodic problem, then you can use the same stencil for all the points, because you have knowledge of what is outside the domain. So, you do not have any problem. So, that is why many a times if you are setting up some uh, new method, then uh, do look at periodic problem, because periodic problem helps you uh, avoid this kind of uh, numerically generated issues. Although that becomes little uh, academic in exercise, but it still assures you that you are in the right track, that you are doing it correctly. Okay. <clears throat> so, if I now look at uh, the previous exercise, that sixth order scheme that we looked at, uh, the term that is uh, dropped out is uh, proportional to h to the power 6 and that is associated with the seventh derivative. Now, uh, what uh, Lele did, uh, he tried to write it in terms of uh, this, thing. you have three equations, right. So, if we uh, decide uh, to solve two of the equations and keep one of the uh, coefficients as a parameter, let us call that alpha as a parameter, then basically what we are doing in writing this, we are solving the first two equations, right? and then we will get the value of a and b like this. So, that will be a kind of a fourth order scheme. right? So, for the fourth order scheme, a is given in terms of alpha and beta, uh, sorry, a, uh, alpha and b is also given in terms of alpha. So, we can um, choose different values of alpha and we can evaluate the corresponding b and we will develop a 
fourth order scheme. Now, if I uh, look at this, there are a couple of issues that uh, comes in the fore that uh, how do we uh, choose this value of alpha, let us say in this case here. We have seen that if we choose uh, the value of uh, alpha as uh, one third, then of course, we go to sixth order accuracy. But suppose instead of taking one third, if I take 0.3, then what happens? It is not surely a sixth order scheme, it is a fourth order scheme, but how good it is compared to let us say if I choose alpha equal to 0.25 or say some value 0.29. Does it mean that these coefficients are some kind of a uh, magic attractor fixed at this uh, points? That means, what I am saying that if I try to write down uh, the error committed So, suppose say I try to plot uh, versus alpha say error and I have a value here uh, alpha equal to one third. I know if I choose this then it becomes a six order accurate. My question is what happens to the error in the neighborhood of this point? Is it a continuous function or a discontinuous function? Uh, this obsession with order becomes so much that people will tell you that if you just uh, go little bit to the left or little bit to the right, you have lost the, the sixth order accuracy and you have jumped down to fourth order scheme. So, you may have uh, committed huge amount of error, but is that true? That is the question that we are asking. The secondly here, that if I look at this discrete derivatives, are they discrete, discontinuous functions of this coefficient? This is something we must uh, 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 keep in mind and you may also like to know, I mean why should we choose any particular value, is there any physical basis or not. Now, uh, that is the question that uh, we are posing here in the end, that if we perturb these coefficients from their uh, obtained value apart from satisfying the consistency condition. So, whatever perturbation we do give, the perturbation should still satisfy the consistency condition you recall that 1 plus 2 alpha should be equal to a plus b that we have written right. Uh, I, th I think so, yeah 1 plus 2 alpha is equal to a, a plus b. So, so what I am suggesting to you that we will perturb all alpha a and b in such a way, but this equation will still be valid. If I do that, what do I get? Do I get a good uh, accuracy or it is going to be poor? This is something that we uh, would be uh, talking about. Well, uh, there are of course, uh, no prize for guessing that this discrete approximation of any derivative is essentially is a continuous function. It is not discontinuous as uh, this uh, sort of supporter of high order schemes would try to tell you that if you do not choose alpha equal to one third, uh, uh, it is not like the error is not like this that you have a point here and then next you have error going like this or going like this. Error does not behave like this. Error has to be, well it could be still uh, some continuous function like this. It cannot just simply be at one point here and the next point it should be somewhere. Else. It, it does not happen that way. So, that is that. <coughs> this issue was uh, uh, addressed by these two scientists from Israel, Haras and Tassan they actually obtained optimal value of alpha a and b uh, to figure out how uh, this numerically established uh, derivative uh, departs from its uh, a very accurate method of uh, evaluating. Uh, what we are basically talking about, let us say I have this equation. given by this. So, all the spatial derivative is embedded in this right. So, here a discrete uh, operation with a grid of size
or uh, I will call that as L h u of h. So, what um, Haras and Tassan uh, did look at they set up a uh, optimal objective function on the error that they said like suppose I look at this, this is my exact operator minus the discrete operator. So, this is going to be a function of all this parameters that we have alpha a b. Now, we try to take that objective function, we try to minimize the error with respect to alpha a and b. Those will give me additional equations, right. How many such equations we can generate? Two only at the most, right, because we have to still satisfy the consistency condition that takes away one degree of freedom. So, you can at the most equate those. That is what Lele was talking about, you know, two parameter family. So, suppose I fix my alpha based on whatever a and b I get, satisfy the consistency condition, and then I minimize the error with respect to let us say a and b, or that means minimize the error with respect to let us say uh, alpha. So, basically, the fourth order scheme will have only one condition uh, originating from this objective function. Well, this is something what you may have done in your high school, right. Optimization by looking at the first derivative and the second derivative, you can find it out. So, those two parameter family that uh, Lele was talking about, uh, sorry, single parameter family essentially gave a uh, fourth order scheme. Uh, so, everything uh, the error including is written as a function of alpha and we try to minimize that error with respect to alpha and that closes the system and you get a optimized fourth order scheme. What Lele did notice uh, that was a very uh, landmark paper by the way, uh, incidentally alumni of this institute you would be happy to note is a faculty at Stanford now and uh, he did this uh, very important paper that he wrote in 1992 found out that this optimized fourth order scheme actually provides you accuracy that is better than explicit tenth order scheme. And that is the reason, the motive for which we will adopt compact case, because this gives you unprecedented access to accuracy. That you would see, if I were to get a tenth order scheme, how many points we will have to take as a stencil, if we are taking explicit method, tenth order. So, it should be 10 plus 1. You have seen right, second order you require 3, fourth order you require 5, so, so on so forth. If we look at the central scheme, it is always plus 1, right. <coughs> so, he could notice this very interesting thing that whatever accuracy that you are getting from a optimized fourth order scheme is better than tenth order accurate scheme obtained in an explicit manner. So, we uh, basically then come to this observation that the formal accuracy of truncation error is really not the criteria, a better depiction would be looking at in the spectral plane. Now, you realize that why we have invested so much of time and effort in learning about waves and spectral analysis. So, without that we would not be able to see all this clearly. So, we will do that, we will do that systematically as we go along. Okay. 